Okay. Here. Okay. Wilson, come here. Come here. Yeah. Glenn, Darion. Anna. Nice to meet you guys. Um, so today we're going to be going over reinforcement. Um, at any time, stop us, ask questions. If you guys want us to review or go back a slide, let us know. We can definitely do that as well. Okay, so we're going to be covering positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, non-contingent reinforcement, differential reinforcement of other behavior, and differential reinforcement of alternative behavior, as well as continuous reinforcement and um, delayed reinforcement. So there's going to be a lot we're going to cover. Stop us if it becomes confusing, because they'll sound similar, some of them will. There will be um, a short quiz test at the end, so you guys can take notes on the things that you have, um, or ask us questions if you want us to elaborate on anything. <coughs> so what is reinforcement? Reinforcement is a consequence that will strengthen an organism's fu sorry, future behavior whenever the behavior is preceded by a specific antecedent stimulus. So it's strengthening measured as a higher frequency of the behavior, longer duration, greater magnitude, or shorter latency. So with this, guys, this basically means that reinforcement, as you all see during your sessions, doesn't always happen when we want it to happen. So a lot of the times our parents reinforce our kids at inappropriate times. And what does that happen? What does that do to the behavior? It increases the frequency of the behavior, the duration. So if they're tantruming, the tantrums are going to get longer. The magnitude is going to increase. So a tantrum that was, you know, before maybe the child wasn't aggressing or engaging in other maladaptive behaviors. Now the child is engaging in these. So the magnitude has also increased. And then these are two common misconceptions with reinforcement. So oftentimes, people believe that we reinforce people, but we don't. Um, behaviors are reinforced, not people. So I'm going to read these examples, and you guys let us know which one is correct. So Billy was reinforced for sitting. Sitting behavior is reinforced. Yeah, so we reinforce... The behavior we don't reinforce the person. The, the person okay and then another misconception with reinforcement is that reinforcement and feedback are synonymous they're, they're the same and that's not true because with reinforcement we know that it always is going to increase the behavior whereas feedback may increase or decrease the behavior so if you give somebody feedback it doesn't mean they're going to change anything it might not. It might it might get better, but it might actually get worse. And with reinforcement, we always know that for sure it's going to increase if it's implemented correctly. Reinforcement and motivation. The effectiveness of reinforcement depends on motivation. Motivating operations, motivation, have a value-altering effect. This means that in order for something to be reinforcing, the client must also want it. There has to be the motivation there. Um, so we always talk about running preference assessments, asking the parents, what do they want to work for? Um, we can't assume that if the child likes trains, they're always going to want to work for trains. They might one day, the next day, or even within the same session. That might not be the same reinforcer. Um, so always looking at what do they want, where is the motivation, what is going to work for that session or that activity, whatever it is that you guys are using. With reinforcement, immediacy is critical. So in order for reinforcement to work, it has to occur immediately. A lot of the times, you might have experience with this, and you might have experienced this in your sessions. You're using something to reinforce a client, and you're thinking, it's not working. It's not working. So oftentimes, it's not that that <laughs> tangible doesn't have any kind of reinforcement value. It's just you're delivering it too late. and so the child does all this work, and then they don't get rewarded until way later. And it's like, well, it's not going to work. It was too long. They worked so hard, and they didn't get it immediately. So in order um, for reinforcement to be effective, it typically has to have a zero-second delay. So it's immediately. The child responds or mans, whatever it is that you're working on, and you reinforce right away. It means that the behavior that was closest in time to the reinforcer will be the one that's reinforced. 
Also remembering if you are waiting, which you shouldn't, if you're waiting, you might be reinforcing the wrong behavior. Mm. Um, earlier, we gave the example of the sitting behavior being reinforced. If you waited two minutes, there's other behaviors that are occurring. Right. And then you deliver the reinforcer, you might not be reinforcing the sitting behavior, but you might be reinforcing something completely different, which may also be inappropriate. Um, so making sure that as soon as that behavior happens, you reinforce that behavior and then move on. Continuous reinforcement. In continuous reinforcement, you reinforce every response. Every single occurrence of the target behavior is reinforced. So this was kind of straightforward. Uh, so think about it with a child who is manding. Um, they man for bubbles and you immediately blow bubbles. Or they man for the cookie and you immediately give them the cookie. And you're going to reinforce the response every time they give it. So if they say, cookie, you're going to give them a cookie. They say cookie again, you're giving them another cookie. Although we don't want to use cookies because that's unhealthy. <laughs> that's just an example. And then what about delayed reinforcement? <clears throat> so you guys might be thinking, well, what happens if the client becomes accustomed to every single response being reinforced and then you can't fade back? Well, this is where delayed reinforcement comes in. And there's pros and there's cons. So it's possible that the wrong response will be reinforced with delayed reinforcement. So it's what Ramit was saying. If you wait too long and the reinforcement isn't immediate, you might be reinforcing the wrong thing. But with delayed reinforcement, you're only going to use this when there's full instructional control. So delayed reinforcement doesn't always influence the target behavior. And this, sometimes you'll come across, uh, if you have older clients, higher functioning clients, that they'll have to earn a certain amount of behavior bucks or tokens or something, and then they get the reinforcer at the end of the day, or they get the big reinforcer at the end of the week. So it's really delayed. But you can't do that unless you have full instructional control with that client, because that's not going to be effective if you have a little guy who's three years old, right? If he does something on Monday and he has to wait until Friday to get reinforced, you're going to have you're going to run into the problem of the reinforcer not being effective, or you thinking it's not working. And it's not that it's not working; it could work for another client who might be older, um, but it's not going to work for the little one. Intermittent reinforcement. In intermittent reinforcement, you reinforce the response intermittently, inconsistently, and occasionally. Not every response is reinforced. So, I'm sorry, before we go on, um, yeah. delayed reinforcement yes. is it's not necessarily always a negative thing then. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. For our older kiddos, sometimes we'll, you know, if, if you do your chores this whole week, on Saturday you get to go get ice right. cream or have a play date with your friend or go to the beach or something. So you have to earn a certain amount of things, chores mm -hmm. or points or something if they're collecting points or like right. what Anna was saying, behavior bucks, um, in order to earn something. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that they're able to get that delayed reinforcer and still understand that they're going to get that item at the end of the week. Okay. Yeah. So does, just thinking about your cases, mm -hmm. um, does anybody, we've only covered a few of them and we haven't gotten into detail for all of them yet, but has anybody here used continuous reinforcement during sessions where you're reinforcing every single target? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So can you give me an example? Two examples of where when you're barely starting, uh, when you're starting a program, you want to Make sure you have that reinforcement constant. So. Yeah, so it's so. continuous. Um, and then what about with delayed reinforcement? Do any of you guys have kids that they have to wait until the end of session to earn the reward? Or okay, so give me an example with one of your kids. Um, he's old, he's older, so he's fourteen. Mm -hmm. So sometimes he, he got now that one of those came in, he, okay. he waits until Friday or that's when we go out and play. But okay. he has to do really well, really well. On mm -hmm. Monday and Tuesday, no, Monday, Wednesday and Thursday that I see him. Okay. Yeah, so it's that's the way he looks for to explain the Friday. And from what you're seeing, does it seem that that reinforcement is effective enough? Yeah, it's very effective. So it's, it goes back to the slide that Renee, uh, Ronit was covering, sorry, um, that she was saying you have to have that motivation. The client has to have that motivation because it depends, the reinforcement depends on the motivation. So he's motivated enough to work three days because he knows Friday he gets this huge reinforcer. The delayed reinforcement isn't always <laughs> isn't always 
Like at the end of the week. It could be no. at, it could like be the end of the session. In between session, right? Yes. So you worked for so long and then they get the reinforcement. Yes. Because that's what I do with my older one. My little one doesn't work so well. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's my little one, it's consistent. Just it's more right. continuous. Yeah. 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 And then the older, I have two older ones and their reinforcement <laughs> is so much more delayed because they're older. Mm -hmm. They are verbal. And they understand a little more. Now, one of them is a little lower functioning than the other, even though he's still verbal. Mm -hmm. So his reinforcement comes a little sooner than the younger one, even though, yeah. you know, they're like right. a couple years apart, but their reinforcement is a little bit, yeah. but it's still delayed. So one works for, um, <laughs> he works for his watching a movie on his iPad. Yesterday in session, that didn't go so well. I mean, he was just, really have him a bad day mm -hmm. and then he uh, ended up throwing the tablet and shattered it mm -hmm. not with me but with his mom yeah. his mom was there and, yeah. so and she also reinforces the delayed so it really works mm -hmm. well when the parent is in tune as well. yes yes so yeah. you've got to have the parent has to be on the same page as the therapist that's and a good point that's yeah. a key that's important because if you come in and you're reinforcing something differently than what they are, it's going to make it that much more difficult to see those behaviors decrease. Yes. Because not all parents are on the same page. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. And then just also with all these reinforcements that we're covering today, keep mm -hmm. in mind that it's ABA is so individualized, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's why it's effective therapy because it's individual to that individual. So with the reinforcements, you know, for your kid, delayed reinforcement works really well. For yours, maybe as well, too. But then some of you guys might be thinking about your clients, and you're like, there's no way I would be able to do that with my client. Mm -hmm. So, but then there's other reinforcements that we're talking about that you're like, yeah, I use that all the time, and, and it will give you more ideas about ways to implement it. Or there might be reinforcement schedules that you aren't using that you might think are going to work with your kids. Well, I think, too, just because I'm thinking about my kids, that... Um, for my little one, six, um, he was in summer school so until yesterday. So now that he's going to be home all day, he's nonverbal, and he's home all day, no one to play with. So he has that extra all day until I get there in the afternoon. And so I'm going to have to spend now more time instead of more playing than more kind of working type mm -hmm. thing, more of a one-to-one -one attention, like outside playing, even though it's going to be 100,000 degrees outside. Yeah. But we have, we're going to have to spend more time and give him more breaks and more continuous reinforcement mm -hmm. than what I normally would do because of the downtime that he has yeah. during the day. Yeah. Yes. And that's another thing, too, to, to take into account that uh, our kids are, they, they're evolving, you know, things are changing in their environment, especially out the summer. So you might have a kid that you were using continuous reinforcement and then the supervisor said, you know, we can now reinforce him or her more intermittently. And now that they have all this time, things are changing. You're like, no, we have to go back to more continuous reinforcement. So they can change. <clears throat> Okay, so with positive reinforcement, this involves the addition of a reinforcing stimulus following a behavior that makes it more likely that the behavior will occur again in the future. So positive reinforcement works by presenting something to the individual after they have engaged in a certain behavior that will increase that behavior in the future. So that's really wordy, so we created a little table to simplify it a little. Okay, so with positive reinforcement, you have a response that's reinforced, okay? So there's the example of holding a cup under a tap and pushing the lever. So that's your response. So here I have my cup, right? And I put it under the leveler, I push the lever, and what happens? I'm reinforced by the cold water going into my cup, and I can drink my cup, or drink my water from my cup. Um, so then the other example is you turn your head and you look the right and I see beautiful Ronit. <laughs> um, so my response is looking and I was my eyes were reinforced with her beauty. Okay. So 
<laughs> that's just kind of a, a little table. And then now we're going to go and we put put it kind of into the three term uh, contingency for, for you guys. So ABC. So what you want is not present. That's what happens before. And then you engage in a certain behavior. And then now what you want is present. So before I didn't have water in my cup. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the soda. So I didn't have soda in my cup. And I ask Roni for soda. Can I have some soda? Sure. She gives me soda, and now I have soda. She positively reinforced me. Okay, so I had a response, and she added a stimulus, which was the soda. So now my the frequency of me <laughs> requesting, manding for the soda is going to go up because now I have that history of, well, she reinforced me last time. So if I ask her again, can I have some soda? she's going to do it again, and then I'm going to do it again, because now my behavior is going to increase. Okay. And I'm continuously reinforcing her man mm -hmm. as well. Yes, because with continuous reinforcement, like Wilson was saying earlier, when you first start with a kid, you want to reinforce them continuously because you want them to consistently respond. So if you're brand new to a case and you only reinforce the kid every once in a while, well, guess what? Only once in a while he's going to work for you. Whereas if you continuously do it, my behavior is going to increase, my manding is going to increase because I know Ronit gives me soda when I ask her for soda. Whereas if I say, can I have some soda? She doesn't give me anything. I'm like, okay. And then I ask again and she doesn't respond to me. I'm not going to ask anymore. So my behavior is going to decrease. It's no longer going to be reinforced. Okay. So this is an example, another example of positive reinforcement. So if you want to watch TV and you press the on button, the TV turns on. Before you press the button, the TV was off, so that's the antecedent. By pressing button, you got what you wanted. In the future, when you want to watch TV, what are you going to do? You're going to press the on button because in the past, you wanted to watch TV, the TV wasn't on. That was what happened before. Your response was you pushed the on button and the consequence was the TV turned on. So now that was reinforced. So in future you want to watch TV you're gonna press the on button similar to the soda if I want soda in the future I'm gonna man for soda because that was reinforced for me before so a child gets a cookie after cleaning up their toys if the frequency of cleaning up toys increases the cookie has served as a positive reinforcer so some are saying a child is cleaning, you give them a cookie, what's going to happen in the future? The likelihood of the child cleaning is going to increase because now they know, hey, last time I got a cookie, this time I'll get a cookie. Do you Question. guys have any questions? Okay, negative reinforcement. So negative reinforcement is defined when a stimulus, which is typically aversive, is removed after a behavior is exhibited. This is gonna get tricky, so we're gonna spend a little more time on negative reinforcement. The likelihood of the behavior occurring in the future is increased because of removing or avoiding the consequence. So a negative reinforcer is something that an individual will work for in order to terminate or escape its occurrence. So something that is already present is taken away after that behavior, the desired behavior, is presented by the individual. So a person's behavior leads to the removal of something that is unpleasant to the individual. So what does that mean? Okay, so this is a huge, huge, huge misconception with negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. And that's what a lot of people think. But it's, it's not. So we created this table um, to kind of make it really simple. So with negative reinforcement, the aversive stimulus is removed and the desired behavior increases. So a really neat trick to determine whether something is positive or negative, reinforcement or punishment, you have to think about what's happening to the behavior and what is happening with the stimulus, okay? So with positive reinforcement, the word positive means that you're adding a stimulus. So there's a little plus sign, okay? Um, and with reinforcement, we already know reinforcement means what? Our behavior is increasing, okay? So that's why we have the little carrot going up. So with negative reinforcement, 
you remove the stimulus because negative means you're taking something away. But what happens with the behavior? It's still going to increase. Okay. So a lot of people think with negative reinforcement, it means that you're adding something and therefore it's punishing. Like you didn't do this. So I'm going to make you do this. You're, it's, that's not what it is. It's not punishing. Okay. So with the example of positive reinforcement that we gave with the remote control. Okay. So you push on, which is with your behavior. And in the future, now your behavior of pushing the on button is going to increase because in the past you were reinforced when the TV was off, you turned it on. Okay. So you're adding the stimulus. And your behavior is increasing with negative reinforcement you remove something and your behavior still increases so we're going to go over some examples right now because i know it's it's a little it sounds confusing um okay so examples of negative reinforcement an individual gets bit by a bug so we've all gotten bit by a mosquito okay and then they put ointment on the itch if the ointment works this is going to increase the future likelihood that they will continue to use the ointment as it removed the itch so you got rid of the aversive situation, aversive condition, which was the scratching, the itching, um, by putting on ointment. So now what happens, your behavior of putting on ointment is going to increase because now when you put ointment out, you took away that itching. Does that make sense? So you're removing the itching, which would be the stimulus. So it's a negative part of the example. And your behavior of doing that again is going to increase. That's the reinforcement part. Okay. So Billy typically engages in behaviors during a reading activity. On Monday, Billy transitions to the reading activity and sustains attention without engaging in maladaptive behaviors for eight minutes. Billy has always engaged in behaviors after five minutes. So you reinforce the appropriate behavior by terminating the reading activity early. So with this example, let's just say, and this is actually one of the scenarios um, that Ramit and I are gonna model for you guys later, but we'll talk about it a little bit right now. So let's just say I'm Billy and I hate to read books. And every time Romit comes over for session, I have a tantrum when we sit and read this book. So she comes in on Monday and I have a huge tantrum for five minutes that we're sitting and reading or eight minutes that we're sitting and reading this book. Okay. And then she comes back on Tuesday and we sit and read the book for eight minutes and I have another tantrum for eight minutes. And then she comes back on Wednesday and it's been five minutes and I haven't tantrumed at all. And I'm sitting and I'm sustaining attention and I'm reading this book with her. She's going to be like, oh my gosh, you're doing such a great job. You know what? We're done reading the book. So she's removing that aversive condition, which is the book. And now what's going to happen when she comes in on Thursday, I'm most likely going to want to sit because I'm be like, hey, I sat and she stopped it. Right? So I'm reinforced. So when she comes on Thursday and she says, hey, we're going to read this book, I'd be like, okay, I'll just sit here. I'll be really good. And then she's not going to finish the book because she's going to be so impressed that I'm such a good listener. And she's going to end the activity early. So that's negative reinforcement. So you're, it's, you're still rewarding the child. Does that make mm -hmm. sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to talk about more examples. So the ABCs. Okay. So you have light. Let's think about the, the lights here, okay? Um, and we'll just stand up. Okay. So the light is on, and um, you press the light switch, and the light is gone, okay? So let's just say I were to be sitting in that chair, and this light is on, and it's bothering me because I get migraine headaches, okay? And I'm like squinting, it's really bothering me. So I get up, and I press the light switch so that the light is off. And now what happened? The light is gone. So I removed that stim the negative stimulus, which is the bright light. Mm -hmm. Now the light's off. I feel better. So it's going to happen tomorrow when I come in. I'm going to turn the lights off, right? Because, mm -hmm. hey, yesterday my head was hurting, so today I'm just going to do it. So my behavior is going to increase. The increased behavior is turning the light off. or That behavior of turning the light off yes. is going to increase, yes. Okay. yes. And it removes... The migraine is she's being reinforced right. for that yes. part of continuous the stimulus the light or the light switch? Right. The, the light, light. The light. Yeah, because that's what you're removing. I yeah. thought the aversive stimulus would be the migraine. Well, the aversive stimulus is okay, so I'm sitting here. Let's break it down. Okay, I'm sitting here and I have a headache. Okay. 
but I'm not getting rid of my headache in the moment, like right now. Okay, so I have a headache, the light is on, I'm going to turn the light off, and then my headache is going to go away or it's going to stay, whatever it is. Um, so then tomorrow, um, I'm going to turn the light off so I don't have that headache. So I'm removing, I'm removing the light so I don't have that headache. And then, um, so somebody is snoring, you put in earplugs, and the snoring sound is gone. So what have you removed? The noise, right? Okay, I'm going to give you guys another example. Um, when you get into your car and you don't put your seatbelt on, the car beeps, right? So that sound is really annoying. Um, so typically, I put my seatbelt on right away because I want to get rid of the aversive sound, which is the beeping. So I've negatively reinforced myself now. I hear the sound, it's really annoying. I put the seatbelt on and the noise goes away. Yeah, okay. Does anybody ever use negative reinforcement in their sessions? I think I did uh, okay. yesterday. Can you give me an example um, of how you think you used it? There and she's like, um, if you earn your last two stars, Anthony can leave 10 minutes early and then we'll be done with session. Yes. So they have um, me leaving so he can do whatever he wants. Yes. <laughs> yep, that's perfect. And then another, yeah, yeah. Um, He's like, yeah, bye. Yeah, yeah. And then we we've talked about um, a kid who doesn't like to do chores. And so um, let's say you had you had a list of him to do. I don't know five chores. That's a lot, but let's pretend mm -hmm. five chores. Um, and he's doing. Typically in the past, he's had a hard time doing even just three. And today he did one and he did it amazingly. So you're like, you know what? You don't have to do anymore. Like we're done. We're leaving. Okay. Have a good day. You know? So um, it's, you, you have to just be careful with those yeah. things because then what might happen is that they, they catch on and they're like, oh, yesterday when I was here, I, I just did one really well, and then she went home. So today I'm going to do the same thing, and then she's going to go home. So you just have to be careful with this. And talk to your supervisors. Don't just leave session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yes. Okay, so we're going to have one more. So um, when we <laughs> don't take a shower, we smell, right? So we smell bad. And in order to get rid of that aversive smell, we take a shower, so now the bad smell is gone. So you've negatively reinforced yourself because you have gotten rid of the smell, which is a stimulus, by taking a shower, and now you don't smell. People will sit next to you during the train. <laughs> It seems to me that, <laughs> yeah. to me that negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement are very similar. Yes. Yeah, because the behavior is still and increasing. And that's why we can be confused mm -hmm. on if we're positive, you know, mm -hmm. positive and yeah. negative. Right yeah, now. it's just remembering it's either the addition or the removal. Yeah. So it's the plus or the minus that makes the difference. So that's the minus is the negative. negative. Yes. Even though to us it seems that, like that's a positive reinforcement. Like because your behavior increases. A, yeah, well it is, in, it is a reinforcement because your behavior is increasing. And the misconception that... Um, I see is that people think because it's negative and you're taking something away, mm -hmm. they think about it as a punishment. But you're not. The reason why you're taking something away is because the child has engaged in something positive. So another example is, um, let's say you have you're in a you have a, yeah. a college class, right? And you're sitting in lecture, and um, the teacher says you all have you you have a paper due every single week, right? Right. Um, but the teacher says like hey, pop quiz for everybody, three questions. If everybody gets this right, we're, we don't have to write the paper today. So then everybody gets it right, and you don't have to write the paper. But see, it, you would think that that would be positive reinforcement, but it's not. No, because she's taking, the, he's taking the paper away. away. He's taking the paper away because everybody got 100%. So now people are going to study because next time he has a pop quiz, hey, we get 100% again, he's going to take the paper away again. So with negative reinforcement, is it always something that is pretty much unwanted, right? Yes. Taking away? You're taking away what's unwanted, but you are only taking it away if the child has engaged in a desired behavior. 
So let's say your kid is having a tantrum and you take something away, then you're reinforcing, you're reinforcing the, tantrum. the tantrum, right? But if like you take the noise, there was the snoring, he put earplugs in, the noise went away. Mm -hmm. But if there was the noise and he started to scream and you remove the noise, then you're reinforcing the screaming, which is an in inappropriate behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Can you go back to the tantrum one? Because that, that, that would make sense. But Okay. So with a tantrum, let's say you have... Um, I have an example. Okay. My okay. little one's nonverbal. Uh, he loves to jump. He'll jump for hours and hours and hours. He's only had ten minutes. So, um, in order for him to jump, he has to, you know, to get his break and jump, um, he has to engage in a certain activity with me for ten minutes, and then it's his jumping time. If he um, is screaming and tantruming while we're engaging in that activity. If I say no jumping, if you don't do this, no jumping, then that's a positive. Could that be a positive reinforcement then? Oh, okay, no. So think about it this way. Um, I'm gonna go back to the tantrum example with him, um, just to make it really clear. Okay, so you have, I'm gonna give you an example of negative reinforcement, and then I'm gonna throw in the tantrum and show you guys how it changes, okay? So let's think about the example with the book that we said earlier. I'm Billy, and when Ronit comes over on Monday, she makes me sit for eight minutes and read this terrible book that I hate to read. Mm -hmm. And she is a great therapist, so she follows through, and she makes me sit through these eight minutes of torture, okay? So then on Tuesday, she comes in, and she makes me sit for eight minutes reading this book, and I'm tantruming the entire time, okay? So now I have tantrum two days, eight minutes, eight minutes. She comes on Wednesday and she sits with me and it's been five minutes that we've been sitting reading this book and I haven't engaged in any maladaptive behaviors. I'm actually engaged in positive behaviors. I'm sitting, I'm sustaining attention, I'm making eye contact, I'm pointing at things. And so what is she going to do? She's going to say, oh my gosh, you're doing such a great job. We're going to close the book. We're all done. So she's taking away the book because I engaged in something positive. So she wants me to know, hey, that's what I want you to do. So I'm gonna take this away so that my behavior goes up, okay? So if you have, so now I'm gonna say the same situation with the tantrum continuing, okay? So let's just say she comes in Monday, I tantrum for eight minutes, Tuesday, eight minutes, Wednesday, she comes in and I'm still tantruming. And she were to say, okay, you know what? You're tantruming, you hate this book, I'm taking it away now. So now on Thursday when she comes in, I'm going to say, if I cry for a minute longer, she'll take the book away. She's not going to follow through anymore. So she's reinforcing my behavior because that's now on Friday, what am I going to do? You're going to tantrum. I'm going to tantrum for 10 minutes mm -hmm. because guess what? If I tantrum for long enough, she's going to give in to me and she's going to remove the book. So two different things are being reinforced. Mm -hmm. The first one I reinforce the appropriate mm -hmm. sitting, sustaining attention. The second one reinforcing the inappropriate maladaptive behaviors of the tantrum. So always being careful on what you're reinforcing. You always want to reinforce the positive, appropriate behaviors. Right. And that's you what want negative, those to increase. Yes. And that's what negative reinforcement does. It reinforces the appropriate behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys need another example or do you guys want to give us an example of session? of your sessions, just to make it clear, to make sure everybody understands this one. So really quickly, um, I have a client that I have to do daily walks with her. So would an example of negative reinforcement be if we normally go around the whole block, but if she's walking really well, not like whining and looking both ways from across the street, I said, okay, cut it short, we're only going half, mm -hmm. is that example? Of the yes, thing? that's a perfect yes. example. Okay. That's negative mm -hmm. reinforcement. Because what is he doing? He's reinforcing her for engaging in the appropriate target behaviors. So, oh my, she's she's doing all this great. You know what? Let's go home. You did that. that that's all you had to do for the day. Um, so that's the perfect example. Um, does anybody think about it like this? Okay, um, one of your kids, somebody who hasn't, I haven't heard from yet. Um, give me an activity that that client hates to do. Three. Okay, so we did the reading example. Give me a different one. Something oh, else that you're applying. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I mean, it's the same thing. So let's just say, 
Um, okay. Yeah, anything that's okay. So okay. sitting and doing. Okay, tying shoes. So the client hates to tie shoes, and every time you tie shoes with the client, they have a huge tantrum. Um, and so today you go in to session after the training, and you say, okay, Billy, we're going to tie shoes. And so Billy does the first step, and he does it great. No complaining, no whining, no behaviors. And then he does the second step of the task analysis, and he does great. And then he does a third, and you're like, oh, my gosh, Billy's never done this before. So then you say, you know what, Billy? We're done. That's all you had to do for it. Or I'm going to do the rest for you. That was awesome. So you can do it either way. You can just stop the activity, or you can be like, I'm going to do the rest. I'm going to finish for you. So that's negative reinforcement. So then tomorrow when you go and see Billy again, he's going he's gonna to do the that. same and thing. Just, like, she helped me because I did so well. OK, negative reinforcement. That one's, it can get tricky. <laughs> Non-contingent reinforcement. If the delivery or presentation of a reinforcer on a fixed time or variable time schedule. Reinforcement is independent of the relation between the target behavior and the stimulus presentation. Um, so when we're providing non-contingent reinforcement, we're not necessarily providing the reinforcements based on the response. It might be on a time. So it might be every two minutes we ask mom, every two minutes provide him with attention. We just want you to come in and give a child attention on a time schedule. Um, or after every three problems that he does, reinforce that. And you're reinforcing that schedule, that non-contingent schedule, rather than a specific response. OK, so we have um, an example of non-contingent reinforcement. Your client is sitting at the table having his favorite snack, popcorn. You notice that she is running out of popcorn and decide to give her more popcorn. The client didn't do anything to earn more popcorn. The client may change her behavior. She may sit still for longer duration or say thank you. Um, so you saw that she was done and you just gave her more. She didn't say, excuse me, can I have more popcorn? Then you'd be reinforcing the demand of her asking. Um, but I noticed that she, ne she needed more. She was almost done and I just gave her a little bit more popcorn. Um, and then, um, okay, so I'm going to give you guys a, a, another, like, real-life example. So let's just say you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and um, he or she gives you flowers on Monday, right? And so they, um, they walk in, and they give you flowers, and uh, you're like, oh, Cool, thanks. I got flowers. Okay. So I didn't do anything to earn the flowers. I didn't, they just came in and they, they gave me flowers, right? So I give my boyfriend a kiss because he gave me flowers. So I'm reinforcing him giving me flowers. But let's just say I waited a little, a little while. We were in the kitchen making dinner and that was it. Okay. So what's going to happen? He might change his behavior. Why? Tomorrow, what, what, what might he do? He might bring flowers again or he might be extra nice. I'm going to change my behavior. I might be giving him two kisses instead of just one for the day because he brought me flowers. Um, so there's still, it's like a simple relationship, but it's not as direct, if that makes sense. So let's say you are on a walk. I'm going to use Wilson's example. So you're on a walk with your client and um, your client, you know, is holding your hand and they're following the rules and you're not really saying very much. And then you stop at the light and you look at your client and you smile at them and you say, hey, you're doing such a good job today. So I'm not saying, hey, you're doing such a good job holding my hand. My reinforcement is not contingent on him holding my hand. It's just, we're walking nicely. Hey, you're doing, you're, you're doing a really good job. Okay, does that make sense? Differential reinforcement of other behaviors. In ADRO, reinforcement is delivered when the target behavior has not occurred during a set time interval. Reinforcement is contingent on the target behavior not occurring. So it's the absence of the behavior. Um, I had a client who used to like to rub our therapist's arms all the time. So we placed a DRO. If he were to go five minutes without doing that behavior, engaging in that behavior, he would get reinforced with something. Um, and so we would have intervals of time, five-minute time samples, and then if he did not engage in that behavior for that time, he would get reinforced for that. So we wanted to decrease that behavior because it's not appropriate. Um, so it's the absence of him doing that. 
And then we have another example. Billy talks out in social skills class and disrupts his peers. The therapist tells Billy that he needs to not talk out in social skills class for five minutes and he will receive three minutes extra of free time. During the five minutes, Billy is quiet. His therapist makes multiple positive statements about Billy's following the rules, the other behavior. So another way to think about um, DRO is think about the O as that omission. So the absence, the behavior is not happening and you're reinforcing the client because it's not happening. Um, like Renee was saying. Does anybody use this in session now? Wilson? Okay, yeah. give us an example. Uh, well, I'm pretty much the same thing. I have a client that's starting out social skills here, so I have to like constantly remind her like, hey, okay, five minutes, let's just sit down, let's attend to the class, and you can get like three minutes playing something like four minutes mm -hmm. or something. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Differential reinforcement of an alternative behavior. With a DRA, reinforcement is delivered when the client engages in an alternative or replacement behavior. Um, so some of our kiddos, if we have um, anybody that engages in hand flapping, we want to teach them to squeeze their hand or put their hands in their pocket. That's an alternative behavior to the hand flapping. Um, so we're decreasing the hand flapping by giving them something else to do with their hands. Mm -hmm. um, So then this is the example of a DRA. So Samantha never remains seated during session and doesn't sustain attention. The therapist does not give Samantha any attention when she is out of her seat. However, when Samantha sits and completes a task, the therapist reinforces Samantha by giving access to chalk, which is highly reinforcing. So um, you are reinforcing them when they are engaged in the alternative behavior. And then with DRA, like Renee mentioned, there has to be a replacement behavior. So we can't expect that a kid will engage in an appropriate alternative behavior if we haven't put those replacement behaviors in place. So if they don't know what else they're supposed to do, then they're not um, going to do it. So I'm going to give you guys another example um, of an older kid that I had. Um, and he would touch inappropriately in public. But he was a teenager, so that's part of just you know, developmentally, that's just what's going to happen with his body. He's going to want to do those things. So we used a DRA. And so maybe for our other kids that are a little younger, um, like a three-year-old, a four-year-old who's engaging in inappropriate touching, we're going to teach a replacement behavior that's appropriate for their age, like squeezing their hands or maybe, you know, touching something else with, um, that's going to give them that same sensory input. But with a boy who's 16 years old, you have to think about it developmentally. That's that's what's happening with his body, right? So um, the alternative behavior, the replacement behavior that we taught him was for him to independently man to go into another room because that is appropriate for his age. And so we used a DRA. Um, so he would request to go to another room and we reinforced him by giving him access to that room for a set amount of time and then we would continue session. That one's a little... What if you're out in the community? You could put in a DRO mm -hmm. for the same example, and so reinforcing a certain amount of time. If you don't engage in this behavior when we're out in the community in public, then he gets reinforced. Yeah, so that's the, the neat thing with all these um, schedules of reinforcement, like we mentioned earlier. They're individualized, so and you can change them. So it's the same exact example, mm -hmm. and it can be that the that can be the plan at home. You're using a DRA for that behavior, and when you're out in the community, it's on a DRO. So it can change depending on what's going to be effective for your client. And it could be that he means to go use the restroom out in public, mm -hmm. and we've had that before where he'll mm -hmm. say, "Hey, I need to go to the bathroom." Okay, go in the bathroom, do what you need to do, and then come back. But that's more appropriate than being out in the community in public and engaging in those behaviors. DRA, I feel like, is the one that we use most, most often. often. Right. Even our little kiddos, um, if they want the cup of water and they're screaming and pointing to it, I'm not going to reinforce that, but I'm going to give you the language to say, I want water. And I'm going right. to reinforce the mand instead of the screaming. Mm -hmm. So you guys use DRAs all the time. All the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
and that's yeah and then the thing to 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 note with DRO, DRO is that um, with omission or the absence of the behavior uh, maybe you are trying to get rid of you know the inappropriate touching and you're reinforcing the child if they're not well what can happen during that time they can start to engage in something else so that's where it's kind of tricky uh, but again you just you use whatever one is the most appropriate for that client and typically the, the supervisor puts those things in place mm -hmm. so this would be a good time when uh it's like for a program for coping skills and like the kids mm -hmm. used to just be in the forehead and mm -hmm. say, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. And you see that it just happen, you know, instead of him doing this, he had actually kind of does this. Is that a good example of DRA? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's mm -hmm. perfect. So how do you distinguish between DRA and DRI then? And a DRI is then? Yeah, so yeah, DRI is um, differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. So um, we're actually going to go over some of these other um, reinforcements on that sheet I gave you guys. Um, so DRI means that the child cannot engage in the behavior that you're trying to reduce because they are engaging in something else that now is incompatible. So I'm going to give you guys an example. Um, okay, you have a client, a little girl who licks people. She goes around and licks people. And so you say, okay, we're going to give her a sucker to put her in her mouth. And that's now a DRI because you can't go around licking people if you have a sucker in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So now the behaviors are incompatible. You can't have them occur at the same time. Um, but with DR oh no you said oh DRA you are teaching a completely different behavior does that make sense so with incompatible it's almost like you're stopping the behavior because you're giving them something else to do so that's the, similar that would be similar to yeah the behavior so that they're doing that they're engaging in that they might want to engage in yes right? so the be it would be similar Yes. So let's say you have, um, we'll use the example with the kid who, um, let's say, does a ton of hand flapping or something. Um, and you teach the client to squeeze their hands or have their hands on their lap, whatever it is that you're going to use. Um, so we're teaching the kid to squeeze their hands. We're going to use that for now. Um, so you're only going to reinforce the client when he's engaged in the squeezing of the hands. So that's a DRA right? But it's also a DRI because if he's squeezing his, hand, his hands, he can't flap his hands. Is so would this example clear? of a DRA be a DRI as well? This one that's up on the board? Yeah, since um, you can't sit and stand at the same time. Maybe the example is on there. Okay. Samantha never remains seated during session and doesn't sustain attention. The therapist does not give Samantha any attention when she is out of her seat. However, when Samantha sits and completes a task, the therapist reinforces Samantha by giving access to talk. Yeah, because she cannot stand and sit at the same time. The alternative behavior is the sitting, and the putting hands, calm body, whatever it is that you're going to do. So they're similar. They are very similar. Just um, think about it with, think about it like this. With DRI, you're not teaching a new skill. So putting a sucker in somebody's mouth so that they stop licking is not a skill that needs to be taught to them. Um, teaching the same kid who's going around licking to engage in an appropriate behavior, an alternative behavior to the licking. So instead of that, we're going to demand for a popsicle. That's a DRA because you're teaching a skill, whereas with the DRI, you're just introducing something that's incompatible with. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys another example. Um, I had a kid, and he was, um, he would do a lot of, um, like, uh, spitting. Mm -hmm. It was kind of almost like raspberries, but it was, like, full-on spitting. Okay, so it was really intense. Um, and so we tried all these other things, DRAs, DROs. It, it, was, it wasn't effective for him, so then we put in place a DRI. So whenever he would do start engaging in the spitting, we would do bubbles, and he would blow bubbles. He'd blow bubbles. You can't blow bubbles and do the whole, you know, at the same time because the bubbles aren't going to come out. So those behaviors were incompatible. The blowing and the spitting can't happen at the same time. 
Does that make sense? Do you want to add anything to that? What would you suggest for a client who, I'm not sure, this, this could have been a, a attached behavior from something else that they probably did, but you know how once you get um, a new client or now that they're in your hands, this, he does this mm -hmm. and he'll clap and he'll squeeze here. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to improve that. So what would you guys recommend for that? Like as far as maybe putting in the hands in the pocket and squeezing or... Yeah, because he's also looking for, for that, that pressure. pressure. Yeah, right. so that's something else to look at because he's needing that pressure. So some sort of sensory input would right. be good. Um, so looking at activities that he could still get that same sensory input mm -hmm. from without having to do this, or it looks more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, Play-doh maybe because it is really maybe it's the same kind of feeling that pressure. So getting yeah. him to play with Play-doh, even like if he's pushing it on the table or something because mm -hmm. then he's still getting that pressure on his palms but then it looks more appropriate than having to do this yeah and that, that's more of a dra because you're not you're still allowing him to engage in that pressure right. so you're not teaching something that's incompatible because you still want to give him that input you're just giving him a replacement behavior that's more appropriate it's an alternative to the clapping mm -hmm. so okay. it's still this pressure so he's still whatever he if he's you know, if he has a stress ball. Yeah, because he's 13, so I'm thinking more stress ball. Yeah, like that's still, he can still push on it, up his hands close to each other mm -hmm. while the stress ball's in the middle. So those yeah, behaviors yeah. are not, not incompatible, right? Mm -hmm. um, so do you see the difference now, yeah. like when you apply it to more specific examples? Mm -hmm. I know some of these get a little confusing. I, yeah, I did get a little confused because it seems that it does seem that there's still something that's being introduced um, as far as even the stress ball is concerned. There's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's being introduced. So, so it's like it's being taught that it's, I mean, there's nothing that, I feel that, I, 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 wrote, I, I wrote that DRA is used when one is like learning. Well, yeah, you're teaching a new behavior. You're teaching a replacement behavior. So instead of so, screaming, we're going to teach him to ask for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're teaching him a new behavior to engage in. Okay. Yeah. So think about it that way. With DRA, it's more you are teaching a new skill. So you are teaching the kid to have, you know, a calm body by squeezing their hands, or you are teaching the kid to engage in squeezing that stress ball. So that they're not engaging in the inappropriate hand smacking. Um, and then if you guys actually want to take out that little sheet, the checklist thing. Um, and then turn to page five. Since we're on here, we're going to um, go through these. Okay, so okay, so let's talk about um, the DRA and the DRA, because that's the one that kind of seems to be confusing you guys the most. Um, so for DRA, Trisha is a first grader and is always out of her seat. Oh, this might be similar to our example. She disturbs the rest of the class and wanders around the room when the teacher is talking. The teacher decides to ignore her when she is out of her seat without permission. However, when she is in her seat and coloring or completing her work, the teacher smiles and reinforces her for working hard. So this is kind of like our um, example with Samantha. So when Samantha is up and running around, we're not going to give her any attention. But when Samantha's seated, and she's engaged in something appropriate on an alternative behavior, we're going to reinforce her then. Um, okay, does that one, is that one clear, the DRA? Yeah, I'm just confused why it's not a DRI because she's out of her seat. So let's read the DRI example, okay? So for DRI, Danny is a boy with autistic behaviors. He self-stimulates by mouthing his hands. Because of the mounding, mouthing, sores are developing on his hands and his doctor is concerned. His instructors, oh, we're on the checklist on page five. 
Uh, his instructors have taught him to hold on to the side of his wheelchair or to play with a preferred toy as incompatible behaviors. <clears throat> so if Danny's hands are not in his mouth because they're on around the truck, or he can't put his hands in, in his mouth if his hands are busy with something else, right? So those behaviors are incompatible. Redirected. Uh-huh. Um, yes, that's a good way to, to put it, redirection. Um, when he mouths, his instructors simply take his hand out of his mouth and do not pay attention to him. So they're redirecting his behavior back. So let's say I'm Danny, I'm sucking on my fingers, and um, they redirect me back to my trucks, and I'm playing with my trucks. As long as I'm playing with my trucks, I can't have my hands in my mouth. Those behaviors are incompatible. Is that without um, saying something? That you, that you just don't acknowledge the behavior except for removing your hands? With the DRI, well, that just depends on how you're redirecting the client. It'll be different for every kid. So with some kids, we can just gestural, you know, do a gestural prompt. With some, we can we have to say a hands out of mouth. Or with some, it can be more indirect, like, hey, let's play with our trains, and then they'll just follow. Um, so DRI, if they're doing one thing, they cannot be doing the other. The behaviors are incompatible. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's another good way to, to think about it. You're interrupting. Um, you're interrupting. Okay. Does that clarify it? Mm -hmm. They're tricky because they sound so similar. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm Samantha and I'm running around, so I'm out of my chair, okay? Um, you're going to ignore me and you're not going to give me attention. And I like your attention, okay? So you're ignoring me, and then as soon as I sit down, which is an alternative, more appropriate behavior, you're going to come over and you're going to give me a ton of attention. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I know they're kind of, uh, they sound very similar, but there's always like that slight thing that kind of um, sets it apart. Okay. Um, so now, do you guys have any questions on that part? Any more questions? So how do you the reinforcement? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You have a question? No, she got no, a question. Sure. She yeah, sorry. sorry. When you're first like building rapport with the child, and if you say sit down and don't, when what you mean by no reinforcement, you mean don't say anything, just go get them. Yeah, just follow yeah. through with your so demands. Yeah. Going. Yeah. So let's say um, I'm your client and you tell me to sit down and I'm not listening to you. Um, and you always want to use the least intrusive prompt. So if you can just point to the chair and I will go and do that, then I'm going to do that. But if you have to physically prompt me and take my hand and take me back, you always want to follow through. So how to use reinforcement effectively. Um, so you want to set an easily achieved initial criterion for reinforcement. So that basically means you want to be real with yourself and to the kid. So you don't want to, if you know that Billy is three years old and has one word mans, you're not going to say, well, Billy has to mand in a full sentence in order for me to reinforce him because it's not achievable it's not it's never going to happen at that moment because he's only manding using one word so you can't expect him to mand using a full sentence and he's you're never going to reinforce poor billy because um, it's he's not going to do what you want him to do and then so you want to use high quality reinforcers of sufficient magnitude so this goes back to what ronit was saying earlier motivation so if they're not motivated for something it's that thing is not going to be reinforcing um, if they don't want it enough they're not going to care so it needs to have enough power um, because remember that reinforcement changes the frequency the magnitude of behaviors um, so if it's powerful it's going to change these things if it's not it's not going to work uh, you want to use varied reinforcers to maintain point in establishing operations so that basically means you want to change the things that you use to reinforce the client because they might become too fixated on something and then it becomes rigid and it, it's going to be it's going to make your sessions really difficult um, and also they might actually just get over something and it's no longer reinforcing so you want to change things up like today he's going to work for 
this tomorrow he's gonna work with it you know and it might be two days he works for the same thing and then it changes after a couple of days um, you want to use direct rather than indirect reinforcement contingencies when possible and um, you want to combine the response prompts and the reinforcement you want to reinforce each occurrence of the behavior initially so this goes back to the continuous reinforcement you want to reinforce every single response use contingent attention and descriptive praise so we want our kids to be independent in life and to live a functional life as functionally as they can for their abilities and so in the real world uh, people don't really give us access to iPads when we do something great at work or give us M&Ms or so you want to pair these things um, with natural reinforcers that we do here uh, so on an everyday basis so if something if you guys do a good job your supervisor will say like hey that was really good today you know that, that was that was awesome and it still makes you feel good it's still reinforcing for you um, and we all when somebody praises us that way we want to continue doing that because we want to continue hearing that positive uh, reinforcement so you always want to pair your reinforcer the tangible with just the verbal praise and your attention it also lets them know what you're reinforcing them for. If I just hand over the M&Ms, the child might be like, I don't really know why she gave it to me. But if I say, you get an M&M because you sat so nicely listened to the book, they know what they're getting reinforced for as well. And then you want to gradually increase the response to reinforcement delay. So this goes back to what we were talking about. You want to first use continuous reinforcement, especially if it's a brand new kid. Um, or a kid who is developing new skills. You want to reinforce them every single time they engage in that target response. And then eventually you want to start fading back to a more intermittent schedule. So um, you're going to reinforce them every couple of minutes or every third response, or every fifth response, so that they're not just like, I get an M&M or I get bubbles every single time I do this. Um, and then you want to shift from contrived to naturally occurring uh, reinforcers. So again, this is um, using more nap things that happen naturally, like high five, good job, you know, things like that. Um, so we're going to have a quick discussion. We, you guys have been great about kind of participating, like giving us examples. But um, what are some of the things that you guys use, items or activities, with your clients in sessions? Well, I, I use um, delayed reinforcement by, by taking a walk to Starbucks at the, on every Friday. Um, I, when, when you said um, good behavior and you did like quotations, mm -hmm. the, that jumped out to me because there's always, I, we haven't like had like an exact program as far as coins mm -hmm. or anything, but I will let him know at the end of the day if he did great or if he didn't do good. Mm -hmm. I I kind of feel that I shouldn't do coins because he's it'll it'll I think it'll create a more rigid uh, situation where he'll he'll be more uh, exposed to tantrums as as oh I didn't get a coin or and it'll probably freak them out. So I try not to um, do that. I, I'll let them know if he did good or if he didn't do good. And mm -hmm. at the end of the week, we'll say, well, on Thursday, you know, we didn't. So, and he'll, he'll, he'll probably get upset, mm -hmm. but we'll do something else similar yeah. at, at home mm -hmm. that will, um, that, that, that's not Starbucks, but it, it'll probably be something either a and pm which is closer to the house mm -hmm. or will um, just jump on the trampoline or yeah. something and that's good too because even though he's not getting like that huge reinforcer which is starbucks he still did do a lot of work during the week so you still right. are reinforcing him it's just it doesn't have that magnitude in value which right. is good that's good mm -hmm. i use um with my little one i use at the end of session he has some stamps and he likes to get stamps on his mm -hmm. hand. So if he does, he does good, he gets one. Like if you did a, a pretty, pretty good job, mm -hmm. he'll get one stamp on one hand. But if he did an extra good job and he knows it, 
even though he's nonverbal, he'll put out both hands. <laughs> and so I'll give him a stamp on each hand, and then he'll turn and give me a hug. Oh. Because he's like, the, I mean, that's at the end of session, so that's it's delayed. delayed. Mm -hmm. But throughout session, I give him continuous. Mm -hmm. And that's it, good. It, it, it has to be, especially mm -hmm. you know, with him. But like you said, every client is different, and you have to adjust your sessions to the client. Mm -hmm. We can't make them adjust to us yeah, at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to adjust our session depending on how they did. I always ask the grandparents, how was his day? How did he do? Like, I know his schedule. If he had summer school, then he went to speech, mm -hmm. and then I come. I mean, that's a long day yeah. for a kid. And it's a long day for me, so nonetheless, but that's a long day for him. And so when I know that his his speech therapist changed just like that mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, and for two weeks, he was really aggressive with her. He'd scratch her, he'd hit her, he'd do this. And, and then finally yesterday, he had an awesome session with her. He had no behaviors whatsoever. Well. She finally listened to Grandpa and said, well, this is how the therapist does it when she comes to our house. You know, she gives him a couple of things to do, then gives him a break. Mm -hmm. Like, and this therapist, she was giving him five different things at one time. You know, you do this, 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 and then you can have a break. Yeah. And it wasn't working, but I give him continuous and then you give the ultimate at the end. The yeah. ultimate one. And that's it's good. His hands yeah. or it, on his hands or his stickers, mm -hmm. and he gets to pick. And that's good, guys, because it's um, sometimes I, I've seen sessions where the kid had a rough day and, you know, it was extremely noncompliant and engaged in a lot of behaviors. And then the therapist doesn't do any kind of reinforcement throughout session or at the end of session because it's like, well, he just was horrible today. But um, tomorrow when you come back, it's going to be even worse <laughs> because he didn't earn anything at all. There were no opportunities for him. And I'm sure there were instances or occurrences during session where the child did do something positive. Um, so it's good that even if you know, okay, well, he, he didn't do enough to earn the ultimate prize, he did do enough to earn okay. this. Yeah. Uh, what about the other, the rest of you guys? What are some things you guys use? I'm a kid on a token system, mm -hmm. token economy system at the end of session. But after every task, I give him a behavior book if he completes the task. Then at the end of session, um, I have him save a five. Mm -hmm. behavior books and he can pay for PlayStation time. And I usually give it in like 10 minutes before session and so he won't be like, oh, when he leaves, I get to yeah. play. Mm -hmm. And that's so awesome. He, so he sees me yeah. playing with him. That's a good idea too because he's like, I have one dollar or one behavior book. Oh my gosh, I have two, I have three. So he's constantly, and he's building up that motivation. Like, I'm going to keep doing great so I can keep getting those behavior books. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to your idea. I use it with my 13-year-old. I'm starting to have a problem with it, though, actually, because he had um, family members come over, and then I think his cousin was about the same age, and she was making fun of him. She's like, that's not real money. Uh, that's oh. fake. So now he, he's kind of like, that's not real money. Like, <laughs> no. Vegas still buy stuff like yeah, that. exactly. Just keep it. like You can still <laughs> trade it in for something. Um, okay, how do you identify what item is reinforcing for your client? Well, they need to eat for positive Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just in your sessions, like how how can you tell it's something they like? Yeah. When they're distracted yeah. by it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Preference assessments. Mm -hmm. um, asking parents, mm -hmm. um, kind of just observing them to see what they're going through, like you said. Um, a good way to know. How do you like I know you're supposed to talk to your supervisor, but how do you deal with a parent who doesn't want to like, I have this client, and she doesn't want us to bring in any outside toys, but then she doesn't want to make, like, a bag of toys a reinforcement or doesn't want to use the iPad as the reinforcement. So, it's like, how do you... What does she, she say what she yeah, wants to use as reinforcers? She said they're all his things, and she wants them to all be open to him, so she doesn't want to, like pretty much constrict him from, oh, he can't use the iPad during this time because he mm -hmm. uses it for this. Mm -hmm. So she said that's why she doesn't want to. Yeah, that's that's difficult. I would, that's kind of a conversation that the supervisor yeah. needs to have with the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where you would say like, hey, have you noticed that behaviors haven't decreased or, you know, there's the progress isn't the way 
you should be going. And yeah, so that's a conversation that the supervisor would have to talk to. So I would talk to the supervisor and have them talk to the parent. That's tricky. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so what do you do when the initial reinforcer begins to lose its power or the child engages, um, changes what they want? Preference adjustment. Your preference adjustment. Mm -hmm. Just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you have to adjust to the kid. So yes. Kids will not adjust to you. Yeah. You yeah. Like, I mean, one day, like you said, it could be, oh, they're really engaging and they want, you know, to jump in the trampoline, <coughs> you know, for a day or two. And then their preference may change for the next week and they want bubbles. Mm -hmm. So you have to be, you have to adjust to that. So I have a question for you guys. What about if you're in session? Those are all those are all correct answers. What if you're in session and um, your kid wants to work for time on the iPad, okay? And uh, so he's working for the iPad, and then um, halfway through the activity, he's having a difficult time, and you say, "Hey." Reward working for the iPad first. You have to do this, and then you get the iPad. And he says, "I don't want the iPad anymore. I want the Xbox." They change. What do you do? Do you reinforce him with the Xbox, or do you make him play with the iPad? I, mean, I let him work towards the Xbox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's okay for for them to change their minds because we change our minds all the time, right? So um, you. This morning, I wanted a muffin, and then when I got there, I decided I don't really want a muffin, I want something else. And I got what I wanted. So you goes back to the motivation. If they're no longer motivated to work for the iPad, they're not going to want to work for the iPad. But if they say, I want the Xbox, and you say in your head, like, well, the Xbox is worth more behavior box than the iPad, that's totally fine, but just make them work a little more for that mm -hmm. so that you can still reinforce them with what they want. So otherwise, they're not going to be motivated. Well, do you to tell them, hey, well, the iPad's three bucks or three dollars, mm -hmm. and then the Xbox, Xbox is five. five. That, that's what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would tell them, especially for like so the higher have to work, functioning kids, like older kids. Like she says, they have to work extra. Mm -hmm. Yes. For that. For that. Yeah. But if they're motivated, they'll do, they'll do it. They'll do it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, with the older kids, you can communicate. And then another thing is, uh, with the older kids, ask them. Like, mm -hmm. if something starts to lose power or power, I magnitude, I have power, I guess, <laughs> value, um, and you're noticing, you're observing that they're losing interest in the Xbox, just ask them, hey, what do you want to work for? You know, and mm -hmm. I know that we have a kid, and, and sometimes we'll look things up online, and we'll be like, hey, would you want to do this? This looks kind of cool. And like, yeah, I really want to do that. Okay, awesome, we'll do that. Um, so just asking them, you can just ask them. And for the little ones, it would be more of like a preference of the center, asking their parents if they can't communicate. Okay, so we have some scenarios. Um, so session begins with a therapist arriving. Child is playing blocks on the floor. Mom is on the phone call in the kitchen. The child gets up and walks into the kitchen yelling, cookie. Mom whispers, hold on, please, I'm on the phone. Child begins to yell louder, cookie, cookie, and tries to climb on the counter to get the cookie himself. Mom is having a difficult time finishing her phone call and seems upset. Child continues to yell. Mom reaches into the pantry, gets out the cookie, and hands it to the child. Was mom's response correct or incorrect? Incorrect. What behavior is she reinforcing? Yelling. The yelling. Mm -hmm. um, what was the reinforcer? The cookie. Good job, guys. Okay, session begins with child requesting to go and play outside. His mother reminds him that she has asked him to clean his room and put his toys away. The child begins to protest and whine, I don't want to do that. Mom ignores his protest and redirects by letting him know that as soon as he is done cleaning his room, he can go play outside. The child flops to the floor. His mother walks into his room singing a song. Child gets up following her into the room. Without saying anything, she begins to hand him toys and puts points to a box. The child then begins to clean his room and picks up his toys. He then gets to go outside and play. Definitely so was this correct, correct or incorrect? Correct. correct. Um, <laughs> she's a therapist, yeah. Um, what 
what behavior was being reinforced? Cleaning the, Cleaning the room. And so what was the reinforcer? Going outside. Okay, I'm going to add another question in. Um, so the mom cleaning or coming in and singing a song and him following her, what is that called? What is she doing there? Starts with an R. She's re redirecting. Yeah, she's redirecting him. Do you guys ever do that? Sing your kids to redirect? I do it all the time. It works. I mean, not always, but <laughs> it works. It does sometimes. Yeah, it sometimes it works. Yeah. You're on a case with a teenager who engages in inappropriate touching in public. Your supervisors ask that you implement, implement a DRA during your sessions. What would this look like? We kind of talked about this one earlier. Yeah. Okay, do you guys remember what we said? Okay. Okay. So we're going to practice. So we've created multiple scenarios for everyone to practice. Um, how many people are in here? Eight? Nine. Nine? Okay. So we can do. One, two. We're going to do a couple scenarios. So basically, um, we're going to hand you a scenario and just pick a partner and one of you will be the therapist and one of you will be the client. Um, read the scenario. If you have any questions about it, if it doesn't make sense, ask us. And then you're each going to role play and we have some stimuli here for you guys to practice. So you guys will each do it. Um, so we're going to give you a few, minute, few minutes and then we'll come together again. Training anything general. I passed around a feedback form in your timesheet. So if you just guys put 9 to 11 training and we'll sign those for you guys. You can have that for payroll. Okay, guys. So we're going to pass around the test. Uh, thank you for coming to the training. We hope you enjoyed it and hopefully you learned something new.